Good evening. Welcome, and I am uh, excited that uh, I get to share with you a little bit uh, of what I've been doing uh, the past couple of years in my studies. Uh, hopefully, it'll give you a better idea and uh, something that we can share in and, and work in alongside together. How's the uh, how's this picking up? Is this okay? Wow. Loud? Okay. Uh, Jim is handing out um, little a third sheet of paper, and this is. Uh, this is some discussion starters, um, some things for you to, to read and to think on. When we get to the appropriate time, uh, you'll have a chance uh, to engage uh, in, the, in the discussion. Uh, throughout this presentation, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to be involved. Uh, don't worry, you're not going to be graded on this presentation. Um, so go ahead and uh, uh, take a look at those as we talk, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, as we move along, raise your hand. I'll try and notice you. Um, if not, uh, when we have our time to, to discuss and participate, we can do that. Uh, we are recording tonight. Uh, I need to submit this presentation in. Um, so uh, my proctor, uh, Dr. Beth Robinson from Lubbock Christian University, is, is going to be here with us uh, in a way. Um, but anyway, don't, don't hesitate to uh, participate, and uh, hopefully we can have a, an enjoyable time here. Um, as Robert said, tonight's uh, program is going to be a culmination of my uh, master's studies in family life education. When I started out as a youth minister in Texas, I knew I needed to grow in, in the scriptures and to be able to preach and to teach effectively, but I also ran into the importance of, of not just working with teenagers, but you got to deal with their families too, right? Actually, if you don't work well with families and you don't support the family as a whole, you're not going to get anywhere working with, uh, with young people. And so uh, with Lubbock Christian just down the road, I, uh, I began studying really with the intent of getting knowledge and skills to help me in my ministry. And uh, a couple of years later, I'm at the point where I can finish. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Jenny is thankful that I will be finishing soon. Um, spend less time reading about family and more time spending with the family. Uh, tonight is going to be part one of a two-part presentation. This Saturday, myself and about six other um, young men-ish, uh, we'll be getting together for a, a bit of a young father's discussion uh, group. Uh, they're going to give me some feedback on some of the things that I've studied. I'm going to share some of the things with them, and, and we're going to get to know each other a little more and uh, share, our, uh, share our experiences. So, I'm going to cover some of the topics that we're going to talk about, but we're not going to get as in-depth tonight. Uh, you'll have to ask the guys after Saturday night how things went uh, to get more of an in-depth uh, conversation about that. Uh, so tonight, I'd like to share with you uh, what family life education is, um, the purpose of it, and its importance in all of our lives, as well as in my ministry. Uh, for this last project, I've specifically focused on uh, marriages and, and fathers in the transition to parenthood, right? Can you guess why? Maybe that was something I was interested in, in studying about. Uh, our uh, son is about 10 months old now, and uh, so it was a good opportunity. But it's such, a, it's such a fragile, exciting jump into, into the unknown um, and, and there's really not a lot written for, for dads. This is what you need to do. This is what you can expect that I wanted to, to have some more information um, to, to share and to have. And so uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing some of that tonight. That'll be the particulars with that. Before we get into it too much, I'd like to share with you a few passages about what families mean to God. Turn with me to John chapter 17. What do we have going on in John chapter 17? Unity. Is that unity? Jesus' prayer for, for his, his apostles and, and His disciples that there would be unity. Uh, John 17, starting in verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may, be all, they may all be one, 
just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Of all the relationships, of all the ways God could have revealed himself to us, what relationship do we, are we reading about here? What perfect unity are we reading about here in, in John 17? The Father and the Son. I mean, that's not the only way God could have revealed Himself, but as a, a family relationship, Father, Son, perfectly united and yet distinct in what they do, God has revealed Himself uh, through, uh, through the family and through that relationship. And so in our families... We provide a graphic image of, of God's relationship with people. As, as fathers and as mothers and as children ourselves, we come to a greater understanding of God's interaction with us. God and families, God uses them to explain His importance of relationships. Let's turn back to Ruth. This will be the second passage I would like to, uh, to share. Ruth is an interesting look into the life of a family because this isn't your traditional mom, dad, two kids, a dog and a cat in a house and picket fence, right? It shows us that God is able to work in any kind of, of relationship. That God can take any relationship and reveal His Son through that relationship. Ruth chapter 4 at the end. Ruth was a foreigner. She was a widow. Uh, she had, had clung to her, her mother-in-law as they went back to Judah. And after all of this had gone through, we come to verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Where does this, where does this family lineage end up? It ends up with Christ. And so... God could have brought about his, his son, his seed, in any way, and he decides here to take this foreign widowed daughter-in-law and make her a significant portion of his plan to bring about his son and salvation for all people. God provided for our greatest needs through the sacrifice of his son, but he also does it through the discipline and the compassion and the wisdom and the connection that we get through our family interactions. If we bring people to Christ, but then we neglect the family, we're not really setting them up for any kind of success long term. I know you all know that, uh, but I want you to know, uh, I want you to know that I know that, and that this, these are the kind of things that I've been spending my time uh, studying and, and looking into. If you get nothing else out of tonight, I'd like you to remember this phrase. One of the greatest gifts that we can give our children is a strong and healthy marriage. Great. That's an awesome goal. Now what? <laughs> How do you do it, right? That's the, that's the substance of, of family life education. Not to educate our kids so that they can go to a good school and so that they can have a good job and so that someday they can retire. All that stuff is well and good. But we want them to have these things because it makes an eternal difference. The relationship that they see in us is going to make an eternal difference in their life. And so how we educate them and how we, we prevent them from getting into terrible messes and how we collaborate as a body plays a large difference in our success there. What is family life education? I'd like to tell you a little uh, story or, or parable about a town. You see the town up here was uh, several, several houses and buildings and structures, but it was built next to this raging river pouring over rocks and it was, it was churning and it was, uh, it was a dangerous place uh, right outside the town. There were signs uh, that warned of danger and yet 
as people often do, they ignored the signs, and these people from the village would, or the town would go, and they would fall into the river. So the townspeople got together, and they said, well, we need to do something, right? What would you do? What do you think? What would you do if you had a town next to a river, and people were falling in and getting sucked away? Titus. There you go. But that's not what they did first. We're going to come back to that. That's the logical answer. Let's prevent people from getting into these awful messes. But that's not what they did. They said, let's put a net down at the end of this river. So when people fall in, we'll catch them at the end, and we can pull them out of the net. Okay? And then we'll have an ambulance crew there to pull them out, and we'll have a hospital where we can, we can offer them treatment if they're still alive. And maybe we'll even put a clinic down there so they can have some immediate attention after they've gotten through this crisis. But as, as our young man so wisely points out, uh, what is it, a, a stitch in time saves nine? An ounce of prevention is worth how much cure? A pound, right? Don't wait till people have gotten sucked down the river of life and damaged themselves to pull them out and treat them. Sometimes that, that's what happens. But collaborate, work together, put a fence up. You saw my presentation, didn't you, Titus, right? Put a fence up over the, over the river and prevent people from just walking blindly in there. Teach classes about how to swim, how to navigate boats, about what happens if you don't put a life jacket on, right? You sink, okay? Rather than just fixing people at the end, let's prevent these things from happening as best we can. Because crises are going to come, right? Has anyone experienced a family crisis in the last year? Something that, is, that has rocked your life? We can't avoid those things in our life, but we can build resiliency and we can prepare for those things ahead of time. We can educate, we can teach. That's the essence of, of family life education. Family life education is any organized effort to prevent family members, to provide family members with information, skills, experiences, or resources intended to strengthen, improve, or enrich their family experience. Any type of organized effort. But what kind of information and skills might be important? Think if you have ever had to wrestle with some of these issues. He never does the dishes, and there are always dirty socks on the floor. How do I teach him to help out? I'm sure no one in here has ever had that complaint. My in-laws are coming for Thanksgiving. What am I supposed to do? Run is an option, right, Gary? My child isn't walking yet. Is this normal? We saw a, we saw a young, young boy just a little bit older than Nathan at the, the sports center a couple weeks ago, and he had this awesome knee-crawling technique. It was like walking, but on his knees, and that's all he did. And the grandmother would ask us over and over again, is this normal, is this normal? I don't know. He's moving around, isn't he? Seems to be having a good time. <laughs> My three-year-old has an imaginary friend. Should I invite him to dinner or should I banish him from the house? My five-year-old just asked where babies come from. What do I tell her? Something about a stork, maybe. I'm a single parent, but I want to be the best parent for my kids. What kind of answers do we what kind of answers do we give a single parent? My parents lo- won't listen when I tell them important issues in my life. Maybe this is an adult child trying to communicate where they're coming from and what important things are, but they can't get their parents to listen or they can't get their parents to be involved in their life. Now let me ask you a question about these scenarios. Would you tell someone to go get some, some counseling or some therapy if they came to you for this question, with, with any of these questions? These aren't therapy-grade questions, right? We don't need to sign up and go find a therapist when we run into these things. But let me ask you this. Is Thanksgiving going to take care of itself? <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just let the in-laws come over and we'll just work it out, right? Everything's, everything is going to be fine. Or, or the what? Order pizza. Order pizza. There you go. Jim has got this down pat. How about when the, when the five-year-old comes up and says, where do babies come from, right? 
To what extent do we teach our young people about human sexuality? Or, or do we explain anything to them? Is that our responsibility or is that the responsibility of someone else? What about being a, a good single parent? That could be a hard question to, to answer. And while we don't have to go and get therapy, you don't have to go see a counselor or a therapist to answer these questions, we know that the, the answers are extremely important, aren't they? The answers that we have to these questions make a big deal. We can't blow them off. Whatever our answers become, they have to matter. One of the things uh, that, is, that is important about education outside of therapy is that we can, we can normalize. We can sympathize with a lot of the, the stresses that we go through as, as families. Now, not minimizing, right? Someone comes to you. Uh, maybe, it's a, maybe they have a teenager who's given them a hard time. And maybe you've already raised your teenagers, you don't belittle them and say, well, I had 16 teenagers and it was 10 times harder than you ever had it, right? But you, you sympathize with them and you say, that, that sounds normal. That sounds like something that they go through. Let's talk more about the normal transitions that a teen would go through. We can normalize, but we don't minimize. We also see from these questions here that, that everyone here engages in some type of education with their family, Right? Has everyone dealt with some kind of question similar to this? Maybe you could add others. We all engage in this type of education, and we all know how important it is. All right, time for some uh, participation. You have uh, in your little sheet there, the first question says, think about the word family. What are the different relationships that are made up in, in the family? This is, I'm starting off really easy here. I'm not looking for anything too profound, Okay. And remember, you're not being graded on this presentation, I am. So, uh, anyway. Okay, but, but between what kind of individuals? So you've got mom and dad. You've got children. What else? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters siblings. Titus? Perhaps you have uh, significant relationships with animals. Okay. Uh, how, about, how about grandparents? Grandchildren? What else? Yes? In-laws. In-laws. Or maybe outlaws, right? Okay, we have aunts, we have uncles, we have cousins. Good. Yes, Bill? Absolutely. But it's the paradigm we have to deal with, right? And it's not just outside of the world. You don't just find step family and, and, and ex-husbands and ex-wives outside of the church. This is, this is the underbelly that we have to deal with. Um, maybe the traditional mom, dad, uh, uh, son, and daughter is the more, I don't know if it's the easy thing, but it's the more normal thing to work with. But the fact of the matter is, is inside the church and outside of the church, we have people representing all of these type of relationships. Now, we didn't talk about adopted siblings or adopted parents or, or adopted uh, uh, or, or half siblings. All of these bring different challenges that we have to address and, and meet. Now think about these relationships. Um, mom, dad, husband, wife, child, sibling. Let's think about all the different variations within there. You can be married and you can be living with no children. You can be living with children. You can be living with your parents. You can be living with your grandparents. You could be living with your grandchildren. You could be living with your adult children at home, right? The boomerang children. Uh, you could also be living with adopted children. All of these offer different dynamics and, and issues that we have to think about. Well, what about the single parent? They can be living without children, or they can be living with children, or they could have parents or grandparents or grandchildren or uh, adult children at home, or adopted children. You can see that it just expands and gets more and more uh, complex. <coughs> Throw in the step family, and you have the same iterations here. But then you've got families who will have a, they'll have their children full-time, right? They have full custody all the time. Or maybe there's, there's part-time. What do you do when you only have your kid one weekend or a month, or every other weekend? You're still their parent, aren't you? And yet you don't have the full access to them uh, that, that a, a other parenting situation would have. 
Some families have his children, and some families have her children, and some families add their children. Uh, kind, of a, kind of a Brady Bunch situation, right? Uh, coming together here. What's the, what's the point here? We all have experience with family, and that experience is valid. And family life education values and seeks the input from, from, uh, from individuals and from families because we know that they're on the, you guys are on the front line. We're on the front line of what it means to be educating and growing our families. But our experience with a family, my experience, my wife's experience, y'all's experience with a family uh, can, be, can be different. And our single experience isn't everybody's experience. We live in and we live with all kinds of families. And I may have an idea about how to function in, in the family that I'm in, but if I want to reach out to someone else, if I want to reach out to a friend who's going through a divorce, if I want to reach out to a friend who's trying to manage his, his stepchildren, or if I want to help somebody who's dealing with, with an adoption, I may not have that experience in my, my memory banks or in, in things that I've done before. We find comfort in the fact that God is the first one to reach out to all kinds of families. God recognizes more than the traditional, uh, the traditional married with, with kids uh, type of family. Think about through Scripture, and maybe you'll have some more that you can add. We talked about Ruth, who was widowed and remarried and later had children. Think about Adam and Eve. They lived through the loss of one of their children and, and through uh, the, the banishment and the difficulty of losing some of their children. That's a difficult situation. What about Mary and Joseph, right? They were betrothed with children through the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's a different kind of, of family that God, God used. Abraham and Sarah, how old were they? What kind of grandchildren could they have had when they had their child? Great-great-grandparents having children. Any other, uh, any other examples you think of from Scripture about God using different kinds of families? Yes, Bill. Judah and Tamar. Oh, there's a good, there's a. Judah and his, <laughs> his daughter-in-law having a child. Having a child. Okay. Yeah. What else? See, there, there's situations that aren't ideal. And, of course, we try, and, we try and avoid those things. But God is able to take a situation like that after it's happened and, and to, to use it uh, to, to repair and to make something worthwhile out of it. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay. Moses had a pretty interesting... Uh, his mother was his, his nurse, right? And yet he grew up, he grew up as a, perhaps an adopted child. <laughs> When we think about what God does with all of us, uh, God adopts all of us. We're all God's adopted children into his, into his family. I want to move into now, we've talked about what family education is. And I want to talk some about why there's a need for a more organized and intentional effort. Uh, there's value in, in the, the little informal conversations we have and the encouragement that we hand out. But I think there's a place for, for a little bit more of an organized effort uh, to, uh, to do this. Why, why get a bunch of dads together on a Saturday evening and talk about your, your experience having your first kid, right? Um, why take a marriage class? Why read a book about uh, relationships, about family? Why go and seek out blogs and other information on the internet? Why engage in these kind of things? A couple reasons I want to uh, address here just, just briefly. Um, Families have specific strengths and different needs. As we've talked about, all the different families uh, have different things that need to be addressed. I was talking with Penny this weekend, uh, and she was telling me about the, the Thai families uh, that, that she works with. How we got into this conversation was because w when uh, my family went to the lectureship, uh, we had to share a bed, right, which Jenny and I typically do. But Nathan had to sleep with us there, too, because there was no crib. Now, Nathan's been sleeping by himself for, for several, several months now. We didn't realize how much of a kicker and a fighter and a, and a pusher he was, right? And so we were talking to Penny about, about not sleeping well. And she said, in the Thai culture, for a family to, to force their, or to force, 
to have their kid to sleep in another room is considered almost a form of child abuse. You can't leave the child in a room alone by themselves at night. They're supposed to sleep with you until they're four or five, and then they decide they don't want to sleep with mom and dad anymore. Sounds, sounds strange, right? But if we went over to Thailand, or if we had Thai people we were working with, and we kicked the door down and said, no, you need to kick your kid out of the room right now, and they need to be sleeping on their own. You think we'd be stepping on some toes prematurely that we might not otherwise need to? There's plenty of well-adjusted Thai children who grew up with their parents, and there's plenty of well-adjusted American children who didn't sleep with their parents, all right? And so there's commitment, and there's common values in both types of cultures. Um, we need to, to be cognizant, though, of the way in which we approach families, that we don't just apply a cookie-cutter approach when you consider all the different families and cultures uh, that we deal with. My, my dad was a, uh, was a doctor, and so his schedule was early in the morning until late at night, and then he was on call all the time. Um, my schedule from, is a little bit different as a minister. I, have, I spend a little more time at home. I'm a little more flexible in my schedule. The advice that you would give my dad versus the advice you would give me about how to connect with the kids is going to be different. It's going to be a little bit different in the specifics. And yet you still have that core value that, Father, you need to be there for your son. You need to teach your son. Whether you work long hours or whether you have, you have a different set of hours or commitments, you still need to provide for your son. You still need to provide for your wife and your family. Uh, another reason um, to, to have a, a deliberate, um, careful approach to how we teach families the scriptures talk about this, but, but what kind of judgment will teachers incur? What does it say? Teachers will incur a more strict judgment, right? Because they have the potential in their teaching to help people, but there's also the potential to do harm. And so if we're going to engage in working with, with families, we don't shy away because it's difficult, uh, it can be challenging business, but we be aware that, that we can also do harm if we don't approach it in, in the right way, in a careful way. We want to be healers. Uh, we don't want to, to harm or to hurt people. The, 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 the type of advice you would give to two parents as opposed to a single parent might be different. I think you get the idea. Different strategies and skills, same values uh, that we teach. Finally, as we talked about before, like Titus said, Put the fence up, right? Don't wait till people have gotten sucked down the river of life. Put a fence up. Be deliberate in stepping in and, and addressing uh, the needs of families before they get into a tough place. I'd like to read to you this, this quotation here. As we transition into what does this mean to us here in the valley? What does this mean to me in my ministry? You can't interact with families and at the same time ignore the moral component or the ethics or the values that are inherent uh, to that. Families bring with them an undeniable moral component. I'd like to share with you a quotation here by a... She's a professor. She writes policy. Her name is Karen Bogenschneider, right? So if you can say that five times fast, you've accomplished something. Listen to what she says about the importance of families and morals. Families teach the powerful moral lesson of commitment and connectedness to others, even when such activities exact a personal cost. The family has the potential to counter the narrow, self-serving, individual, individualistic agendas forwarded by advocate, advocates, special interest groups, and political action committees. When, when we're told that, that, that we, should, we should go out and, and get what we want, we're faced with the reality that our family exacts a cost, that there is a price to pay in raising our family and in teaching our families. In a society that is often focused on getting more, the family perspective reshifts the focus to giving more. In a nation built on the premise that every person is endowed with certain unalienable rights, the family perspective serves as a reminder that these rights come with responsibilities. In a culture that often uses money and material possessions as a sign of worth, worthiness in families comes from actions that are difficult to ascribe a dollar value to, such as commitment and self-sacrifice by each for the other. 
When the world says that we need to go out and get more, our family tugs on us and says, no, we need you to give more. When, when our nation says that, that you have rights that are yours and no one can take you from them, our family says, yeah, but you have a responsibility in those rights. Those rights bring responsibilities as well. When the world says that these things, education and, and cars and houses and materialistic things, that determines your worth, you run after those things for too long and your family falls apart. Because your family says there's things that are more important to life that we can't tag a dollar amount to. I mean, what's the cost of commitment and of integrity and of patience and of discipline? Can you put a dollar amount on that kind of stuff? I think this is a, this is a very wise uh, quotation here. <laughs> Something interesting I found as I was researching, um, we're going to get into marriage education and specifically talking about fathers, but these, uh, these folks who were leading marriage education realized, wait a minute, we've got these religious organizations that have been preaching and teaching the values of morals and commitments. We should probably turn to them as a venue for strengthening as a platform from which to send out education and ways of, of improving our family life. I mean, you would hope of all places in the world that the church would emphasize family, right? Uh, sadly, it's not the case. An, an acquaintance of, of our families, uh, she, uh, she had recently gotten married and she went to one of her religious leaders and said, my husband and I just aren't getting along. He's young and immature and, and uh, I'm just, I don't know if I can put up with him. And the religious leader said, well, when it really comes down to it, you just got to do what's best for you. You know, you got to do what's best for you. So she walks away from there already wanting to leave this guy. And the church has rubber stamped it saying, you got to do what's, what's best for you in the long run. I want to share a couple reasons why churches can play a significant role in marriage education. Easy, easy first question here. Where do most people get married? Who said that? This is a dunce chair up here. And we can put you in it right here if that needs to happen. In a, in a church building, uh, in some kind of religious organization, likely you have a minister or you have somebody connected with the church who's going to be performing that ceremony, right? Words from Scripture are often read. Uh, churches already have access to people who are getting married. And, and if we don't know them, often they come to us saying, well, I need, a, I need a preacher to get married, right? I need a church building to get married in. It's a prime opportunity to reach out and, and attempt some form of, of education and, and teaching. It's refreshing to me in a lot of my reading and study to hear scientific people say things like this, that religious institutions are important civic components of all communities. Churches make a difference, and the message that we teach makes a difference in the community. And we have an opportunity to connect uh, with, with this target audience. Think about what kind of resources religious organizations can offer. What kind of resources do we have that would make it more easy, more, more readily available for people to have some type of uh, marriage class or premarital education. Okay, M maybe we have that service already. If you're going to have a class, what are some things you have to think about in order to have that class? A heard teacher? You've got to have someone to teach, okay? <laughs> you gotta have stuff, and you gotta have a you gotta have a place, a venue, right? You gotta have a, a building to have that. You gotta have meeting times. Uh, the church has all of those things. We have we have structures. We have meeting times. Uh, we have people who would be eager to engage in in education. Um, some researchers even went as far out to say, well, can we even train people from a church? Can we even train ministers to give good uh, marriage? counseling and premarital classes well what do you think the results were that came back they said well yeah it looks like we can train people to offer this to offer this kind of stuff uh, it looks like there's there's resources there that can be taken advantage of the 
Let's think about families that are hard to reach. Uh, there's a phrase in family education. Family education suffers from underwhelming participation. Right? How was participation? Oh, it was great. It was underwhelming. <laughs> right? The opposite, the opposite of what you want. It can be difficult to reach out to people in need. Often the people who are in the most need are, are the hardest to, to get a hold of. How might a church help in, in reaching out to people who would not otherwise have access to a class? Tiara. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, so there's a parent or grandparent who we're familiar with. They know that their, their uh, child or whatever is having a hard time. And so that's access that, that just somebody who was out on their own freelance teaching this stuff wouldn't have connection. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I think that's a very good point, um, the, the intergenerational connection. You think about the church. Uh, I've heard this said about uh, that uh, preachers are, are, and, and churches are there when people are hatched. They're there when they're matched, and they're there when they're dispatched, right? Churches deal with people across the whole uh, lifespan. We'll talk some more about that here uh, in a moment. Furthermore, once a, once a program ends, once you've gone through your, your week or your month or whatever of intense marriage education, it's good to have encouragement and, and some booster sessions after that, right? Some relationships that will help you continue to remember the lessons that you've learned. Uh, churches provide that ongoing uh, connection. Finally, and this is what we talked about before, what tends or what ought to be the church's stance on things like commitment, marriage, and purposes in life? It ought to be that commitment is critical and that marriage is one of the most valuable things, uh, that, one of the most valuable resources the church has, and that we all live for more than to work and to play. We live for greater purposes than, than that. And it's these type of, of ethics and morals uh, that make, make churches great places for this type of education to, to go. With the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I'd like to focus on some of the things that, that we're going to cover in our little discussion group. Um, this is normal things that all families are going to go through when they transition through, uh, through parenthood. As you think back through your, through your life, um, you, you may remember some of these things if, you've, if you're your kids are farther along or they're already uh, out of the house. But this is what does family education look like. This is what the class looks like. This is what you can put your hands on. How can I support, how can I support young fathers and myself during such an important time, such an important transition to parenthood? Is there any marriage that doesn't need some kind of maintenance or attention? Right? Is there anyone here who's got it all figured out whose marriage doesn't need, uh, need that kind of thing? Every marriage needs that kind of attention. But what are some unique factors that, that, that young parents go through uh, that, that make the addition of a third person into the family more challenging? You guys going to work it out over who goes first? <laughs> Gary, go ahead. Uh, lack, of, lack of experience Yeah, we're just dumb kids, right? We're not sure what we got ourselves into. I said it for you, so you didn't have to say it. Tiara, go ahead. Right, right. It goes back to the opening sentence that one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children is a strong and healthy marriage, and yet this little creature that yells and screams and wakes up at all hours of the night demands our attention. I can't logic with it and say, look, I need to go spend some time with your mother 
can you just chill for an hour and, and I'll be back? You can't have that kind of conversation with them. They demand your time, and yet if, you, if we allow our marriage to be shattered uh, by that, then, then what, have we, what have we given them uh, in, in the long run? It's a, it's a fragile time. It's a significant transition. But it's all normal stuff, right? Oh, you're having a kid? Well, you better go get some counseling, right? You better go sign up for counseling. This is normal stuff, but it's significant stuff. Um, I'll go ahead and click this up there. All right, the second thing that I gave you asked dads, how many dads here attended the birth of their child? Like you were in the room while the magic was happening, right? Okay, most. Are there any here who were not in the delivery, in the delivery room? Okay, we, we have a couple. Um, it's... Let me just share some statistics here, okay? 50 years ago, barely 5% of fathers were inside the, uh, were in the, the delivery room. It's just not something that ever happened. And so uh, I wasn't surprised necessarily to see uh, CB's hand go up. Um, but it's just not something that happened. Um, you know, for thousands of years, I suppose, dads weren't in the delivery room with the babies and everything worked out okay. But today, over 90% of fathers... Who, who, who live with the mother. Um, 90% of fathers attend their child's birth. And even 40% of those fathers who are, who are not married, uh, who are separated, they will attend. And so the vast majority of dads today, as you saw by the, the hands raised, are in the delivery room. Now let me read this quotation here by a, a, a midwife. Her name is Ina Mae Gaskins. And I think this is uh, insightful. Our society demands... Our society makes demands on first-time fathers that exceed those made upon medical students. Remarking that medical students are expected to get pale and sweaty when first exposed to new medical situations, they note that there are no consequences when they must leave. On the other hand, no such allowance is made for first-time fathers. Most of us who have gone into the delivery room, this is the first time we're going to be in a pseudo-operating room situation. A medical student sees things he's never seen before, and, you know, he can check out. The, the expectation today is for dads to, to be there. Now, some would argue against it, or, or some would believe that it's not necessary. Regardless, dads are going to be in the delivery room. And so if you're a dad and you're expecting, this is a choice that you're going to have to make. And when you're in there, you're not going to turn to your wife for advice. Honey, what am I supposed to do now? Right? Right? The doctor's going to be busy with things. The nurse is going to be busy with things. And so what is dad supposed to do? What's his role supposed to be? And all men, we love to be in a situation where everyone else is an expert and we're not. Right, men? Don't we love that kind of situation? Boy, I'm the dope here. I feel good about that. Being at peace with being the uneducated one and yet providing that, that tender, uh, kind attention um, that, that makes such a big deal uh, in the lives of uh, of, a, of a mother as, as they're giving birth. So some of the things are, what's a mom and baby, what are they going through? What kind of changes are they going through? Um, what is a doctor or a nurse or a midwife or a, or a doula or a pediatrician, right? What's my relationship with these people supposed to be? And what's my role during birth should I choose to, uh, choose to attend? These are important things to, to consider. Um, I want to talk now about uh, these, these final lists here about um, some, some ways that a man or a young father can lead his family through, uh, through this time. And th the wonderful thing about family education is that, is that you get up here and, and you may not get it all right yourself, but it's, it's something that we're all trying to work through, uh, we're, work through together. So I by no means understand this. I just, I guess I've been reading on what the roadblocks are supposed to be. Now, whether or not I go through the roadblock or go around it is sometimes a different, uh, different question. Um, first of all, how to resolve conflict um, when, when, it, when it comes up. How to manage disagreements that inevitably arise. Uh, these, these researchers did a study, and they got a bunch of young couples, and they said, we want you to come in for about uh, 20 minutes, and we want to interview you about your experience, and then we'll, we'll let you go and just to get some data. What ended up happening was at the end of the interviews, the couple said, we don't care about your findings. The best thing for us, for us is that you made us take 20 minutes and talk about our feelings and our expectations and our frustrations, right? The key to conflict management is take time and listen. What are the two problems? 
We don't have time. We don't often listen very well. And so teaching and encouraging that, that having time to listen and to talk uh, and to understand is, is something that, that needs to be addressed. And then just the frustration at trying to find that kind of time is a good thing. Spirituality, maybe you can ignore it as a, as, an indiv- as a single person or maybe even as a couple that gets married. But when that young one comes along, you know, are we going to take him to church? Is he going to be involved with church? What are we going to do uh, with his spiritual life? It really forces mom and dad to wrestle with these issues and it forces dad uh, to, step, to step to the plate or, or to not. Um, spiritual things are brought into sharp focus during this time. Um, something we don't talk about a lot, but, uh, but intimacy, right? Mom is eight weeks, eight months pregnant, right? And, you know, how do you have that romantic time when she's not at all feeling like being romantic? Or maybe two, two months after the baby's born and mom is still recovering and she's still understanding, you know, what does is, what is baby need and dad's working long hours and we just don't ha- have time to, to be romantic and to be together. Um, one of, the, one of the, the articles I read says that both mothers and fathers can become discontented with intimacy due to physical or emotional exhaustion. So it's saying that, Mom and Dad, you're probably going to be discontent with your intimate relationship for a while. However, despite this fact, most parents can remain happy in their overall relationship after pregnancy. Couples can compensate for a decrease in intimacy with increased touch and affection and kind words and extra help and other types of meaningful interactions. Maybe the, maybe the bedroom is sort of off limits for a little while, but, but there's other ways of showing each other that you care, and that becomes extremely important during this, this transition. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll try and finish up here in the last couple minutes that we have. How are we going to manage time with our family? Uh, our solution was just move away, right? Move 3,000 miles away from everyone. No, that doesn't solve things because grandma and grandpa still want to have a role in, in their child's life. Um, your, your friends and your acquaintances at, at church and other places want to have an impact in your child's life. There's a lot of people around who want to have an impact in your child's life, but maybe they don't want to have the right impact. Are we talking about how other people are influencing these things? Are we so busy in, in, in what's going on here that we're not talking and, and communicating expectations about this? What role do we want our parents to play how are we going to communicate this role, right? Who's going to talk to mother-in-law about that kind of relationship, right? How are we going to manage those things? Do we agree on how much time we will spend with others and how much time we will reserve for ourselves? <coughs> I found it very interesting as I, as I was thinking about uh, the dads that are here. I want you to think about all six or seven of us dads who are just coming into this relationship, uh, transitioning into parenthood. We're all going through pretty crazy job uh, situations right now. Like, I'm trying to finish up my education here. James is taking a huge engineering test. Jake just changed jobs, right? And last week he took a test. If he passed it, great, he has a job. If he doesn't, you know, sorry, Charlie, you're out of luck. <coughs> uh, Daniel, Daniel Schramm, who's an expectant father, he's going through a major job change um, right now, we think about uh, we think about Jeremiah Collins. He's going through a major job change uh, right now. How do we manage work? How do we manage these challenging transitions that we're going through, and yet still have time for our for our families? Think about all the tasks that a parent must accomplish. Does having a baby, in and of itself, Make everything great in your life? Does that fix your relationship if you've got relationship problems? Does it fix all of those things? Is it the magic? It's not. Um, there has to be conversation and deliberate uh, focus on these, these areas. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to close with, uh, with this thought here, and then I'll open it up for a few questions. Children learn by what we live. Our children learn about love and marriage from how we treat each other. They learn what mom and dads are 
they learn what husbands and wives are from watching us. We teach them who and what is important by how much time and what kind of time we spend with them. When they, uh, when they encounter a strong marriage and they see moms and dads loving each other, that's where security comes from. One of the greatest gifts that we can give our children is a strong and healthy marriage. As a church, we, we extend the gospel. And if, if we help people in their family, but we don't teach them the gospel, then as a church, we haven't met, uh, we haven't met our charge and our goal. Without this, our education is for naught. However, marriages and families, the gifts that we give to our children, don't they make an eternal impact in their life? And if we teach someone the gospel, but we fail to meet them in their needs as a family, then I think we've, we've, failed them a, we've, we've given them a disservice. We're talking about eternally important things, things that, that go generationally and that are passed on time and time again. I appreciate your attention. Uh, I'm glad I was able to, to get through my material tonight. Um, do we have any uh, questions about this material specifically, um, about, about a broader context uh, of, of my degree? Is there any uh, question that you have that you'd like to ask before we close things up tonight? Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. You want to go to coffee sometime, Gary? Any other questions? My books tell me I'm supposed to wait seven seconds, so I'm waiting seven seconds. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, being a part of this tonight. Um, thank you for letting me present this to you. God bless you and your, and your families, and I look forward uh, to working with you our journey toward heaven uh, as, we, as we strengthen our families and go there together.